Um, but anyway, thank you for coming along. I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the interest in this workshop. Um, there are so many people coming on it, and I think that's absolutely fantastic. It's amazing that people are so interested in spiders. I mean, obviously, I think they're amazing. Um, in fact, spiders are uh, one of the sort of one of the groups of animals that got me into the natural world as a kid. I've loved them since I was about six, um, and I wouldn't be doing this career, the career that I have, if it weren't for spiders. Um, and it was my my grandfather who got me into these sorts of things when I was a kid. He was a miner in the northeast of England and he used to take me out um, looking at wildlife, particularly um, pitfall trapping for um, insects and spiders and also going out looking for uh, lizards and um, amphibians and fossil hunting, which was great fun. Anyway, I'm Chris Catron and I am the director of Caledonian Conservation, which is an ecological consultancy based in Scotland. We do all sorts of things, um, but one of our big work areas are invertebrates and we do that do work on them for uh, developments and um, also for government agencies and uh, charities. Um, I'm also the um, the area organizer for large parts of Scotland for the British Ratnological Society Spider Recording Scheme. All of those spiders uh, on that side, incidentally, you can find in Scotland. So yeah, that's me. And that is um, arguably the largest native species of spider um, in the UK, which does occur in Scotland, um, Arrhenius quadratus, the four-spot orb weaver. Um, it's the heaviest. I think the largest one that's found was about the size of a ping pong ball. Uh, totally harmless though. Yeah, and that's another fantastically huge spider, the um, cave spider Meta Minardi, uh, which people tend to say is black. But as you can see, if you sh shine a spotlight on it, as I have there, um, it's quite pretty. It's got all sorts of markings going on. So just to give you a run through what we're going to do. Um, so we're, in the first session, I'm going to just give you this presentation. After that, we'll have a wee break and then we'll do some microscope work. Because of the numbers involved, um, I can't really make that too interactive, but I'll take us through identifying a couple of spiders and then have time for questions. Um, and we'll have time for questions after this presentation too. So I'll just give you a wee introduction to arachnids. Um, so spiders are a type of arachnid, spiders are araniae. So we'll focus in on those. Then we'll focus further in on Scottish spiders and I'll talk about a few um, special species for Scotland. Um, now, there's a lot of species and these are ones I've really just picked because I like them. Um, and I'll talk a wee bit about finding spiders. And like I say, we'll then move on to the identifying them. So arachnids. Um, this is an arachnid. Um, it's not a spider. It's a sun spider or a camel spider or red roman, depending on your preference of common. It's all fusae. They don't occur in Scotland, um, but this is a, a group of um, arachnids which I've wanted to see since I was about six and I was lucky enough to finally see them um, about 10 years ago in Africa. Uh, but there's a huge variety basically. Um, these are all the groups of arachnids um, in the world um, and these four are the only groups that occur in Scotland. So we will focus in on those. So this is a spider. Um, this is another four spot orb weaver, one of the really big ones um, sitting on my hand. Um, they're quite variable in color. They're very pretty spiders. They can be green, they can be red, they can be purple, they can be gray. Um, yeah, they're just really cool. And as you can see, it's got two body parts. It's got um, a, an abdomen and a cephalothorax. And the cephalothorax has all the legs coming off of it and its arms. Um, and they have um, eight or six eyes. This is another type of arachnid. This is a harvestman, a pileones. Um, as you can see, they have only one body part and they have only two eyes, which are usually on a turret in the species that occur in the UK. Um, unlike spiders, they don't spin silk at all um, and they don't have any venom, but they are top predators. And I have seen harvestmen and uh, wolf spiders come up against each other just when I've been out looking at bugs. And it's usually the harvestman that walks away from that. This is a pseudoscorpion, it's Neobysium carcinoides. Um, anyone who looks at pseudoscorpions in Scotland will know that 99.9% .9 of the time you find a pseudoscorpion, it's Neobysium carcinoides, the moss nipper, but there are other species available. Um, and they're really cool. They look a bit like uh, scorpions, but they're not very closely related at all. They uh, clearly don't have tails. Um, um, they And they have between zero and uh, four eyes. 
um, and they have these fantastic um, chelicery. So all, all of the arachnids have these um, sort of mouth structures called ch chelicery, which are adapted in different ways. When spiders, there are fangs um, that inject venom. Um, with pseudoscorpions, they actually spin their silk um, from their from their chelicery, from their jaws, um, and they and they have these wonderful um, pincers as well to catch prey. And they're top predators um, in soil ecosystems. They're really small, though, about um, between one and four millimeters long. And this is a tick acari. Um, not my favorite arachnid, I have to say. They do um, transmit some pretty horrible diseases around the world, um, in, including in Scotland with Lyme disease in particular. But mites are also acari, and there's all sorts of those. So in terms of numbers, in the UK, there's about 660 species of spiders. In Scotland, um, there's actually 443, I think, species in Scotland now because Sia Bionor Larry, a jumping spider, has been recently um, confirmed from Scotland. Um, Harvestmen, there are uh, about 26 species in the UK. Um, they may have gone up since I made this slide, uh, and about 17 in Scotland. So far, smaller number. And honestly, um, if someone had told six, six year old Chris, or maybe more teenager Chris, when I was really getting into identifying things, that there are so few harvestmen, you can identify a lot of them from what they look like once you get your eye in, um, maybe I would have focused on them first, but no, I did spiders. Um, pseudoscorpions, 27 in the UK and 13 known from Scotland. I, I mean, I really think there's probably 14 at least in Scotland because there is a species um, called um, Microbysium brevifemoratum and it uh, lives in bogs and you'd, you'd think it would occur in Scotland. Not found it yet though. And in terms of ticks and mites, nobody knows, but we do know there's tens of thousands of species. Unfortunately, in the UK, we don't um, really study mites which don't have negative impacts on our agriculture. Moving on to spiders. So as I've mentioned, there's about 660 species in the UK, 443 in Scotland. Um, there are 27 families of spiders in Scotland. Um, there's quite a big diversity. Um, and there are 12 UK Biodiversity Action Plan species. Now, of course, UK BAP is defunct um, and has been for all of my career, but it's a useful measure. Um, there are eight Scottish Biodiversity List species, 16 Red Data Book species, 58 Nationally Scarce species, um, three Introduced species, and eight Synanthropic ones. So that's species that just live around human habitation. And there's nothing much to take away from this, but other than these are were the UK BAP species. And you can, in brackets, I've got the families, and you can see most of the species are from the family Linifidae. They're money spiders. The Scottish biodiversity list species, um, there are quite a few Linifidae as well. Um, and the curious thing is the two lists are not very similar. I'm not entirely sure how they were arrived at. Probably more, um, more important than necessarily particular species, are the habitats that we have in Scotland that are special. Um, so because we have these special habitats, we have special communities of um, spiders and we have rare species which are associated with these habitats. So we have these wonderful montane habitats, um, peatland habitats and Caledonian forest. Um, now, you may not get a huge diversity uh, of species or a huge number of species in these habitats, but what you do get tends to be really special and not found elsewhere such as this. Um, this is Philodromus margaritatus, the lichen running spider. It's a really cool spider that you can find in Caledonian forests. And that's its distribution. Um, it's an interesting one. You see it's disjunct. There's um, there's populations in Scotland, in the north and the high, and also in the south of England, which is curious. And there are other species which have similar distributions. I suppose in the past there is probably suitable habitats between um, the highlands and the south of England, and we've since lost that. Um, they, they hunt on the trunks of lichen-covered trees. Um, so you can see from the picture, it blends in very well with that um, type of um, habitat and they can even change colour ever so slightly and they're active hunters um, so they run run on the on the lichen covered trees and catch prey um, and they've got these organs um, 
on their legs, which allow them to stick to trees very, very well. They're very difficult to get off trees if you do find them, um, and they're very hard to spot. I've I found and I've seen them a few times in my life um, when I've been looking for them um, under bark traps and things, and also um, when they've been on um, like human wooden structures because they don't blend in very well with that. They're mature May to August, so most spiders you can't really identify unless they're um, adult and they'll have particular adult um, seasons. Philodromus margotatus is actually quite distinctive. And there's been quite a decline in range, so at least 70% since 1992. Um, and they were a UK bat species and um, nationally notable or um, nationally scarce. Uh, this is a narrow-headed wood ant, and the reason I've got this up here, uh, it's a really cool ant, um, is because of this spider, the wild gallows spider, Dipena torva. Um, so this spider specializes in hunting wood ants. Um, and it's re got a really cool way of doing it. So in the past, people thought that the spider um, may spun uh, webs in the gaps of tree bark. Um, but Mike Davidson spent a lot of time looking at them and studying their behavior um, and found that, in fact, they spin, they spin trip wires across uh, wood ant commuting routes, um, and these then um, attach out to a branch or something that protrudes from the tree where the spider waits. Um, and when the ant crosses the trip wire, it swings out on on this and hangs underneath the branch. And um, Dipena torva um, comes down and bites a soft spot in the head of the ant, injecting venom and digestive juices, and then sucks the guts out of the, sp uh, out of the ant. Um, as you can see in that picture, the, there's a quite a size difference, and, and I've seen um, really young Dipena torva, smaller than that, um, eating wood ants um, using this method. So it's really super cool. And this is their distribution. Again, they're, um, they are found just in the highlands. Um, so it generally associated with Caledonian forest, although I have found them in birch woodland. And the thing is, wood ants don't ne don't necessarily um, live in pine woods. They do also live in uh, mixed woodland and broadleaf woodland. It's just harder to find their nests. So presumably there were wood ants in this um, in this birch woodland too. Um, they, the spider was a bycatch. It wasn't what I was actually out looking for. Um, but that's still pretty cool. Um, they're mature June to September, um, and they, um, they're pretty rare, so they're Red Data Book too. Um, I have found that once you get your eye in for spotting particularly the webs with the ants hanging off them, because they, they leave them there, so you'll find dead ants in this um, situation. Once you get your eye in for that, you can spot quite a few of them when you're wandering around the Caledonian forest in particular. This is a personal favourite of mine, the bog sun jumper, Heliophanus dampfi. Um, now, this spider lives on raised bogs, um, and it was previously known particularly from Scotland and one site in, in Wales, but there have been several populations now found in England, um, which is pretty cool. They're still fairly rare, though. Um, and in Scotland, they're found in, in Stirling and Falkirk areas, although they've also now been found in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, they particularly occupy lowland raised bogs like this, um, this is Octotire Moss, which is a, a site of special scientific interest, and one of the features is Heliophanus dampfi, the bog sun jumper. Um, and historically, people thought that they were found um, on birch regeneration. Um, I suppose that's because that's where people did find them when they were out with sweep nets looking. Um, but I found using bug vac, which is a, a vacuum sampler, it's like an industrial um, petrol-driven or electric-driven pooter, um, <clears throat> which can suck bugs up that they actually seem to hunt out on the moss or, uh, when it's sunny, and you can spot them jumping around, they're really cool. Um, and sh they shelter in the millennia tussocks on the bog, um, and that's where you can generally suck them up with a vacuum sampler. And I do wonder if it may, may be over winters in tussocks, because they, they're mature April to July, it says April to July. In fact, um, they've been found much later than that, well into August, um, September, October time even, um, but not so commonly. 
but they, they're mature in April, which is pretty early for a spider. Um, and I've certainly found with a, a closely related species, which also lives on bogs and looks effectively identical, called Heliophanus flavipes, that that species overwinters one molt away from adulthood um, in tussocks and then comes out in, in the spring and presumably sheds its skin and is mature and ready to, to mate um, as soon as possible when conditions are right. And it's, it's quite possible Heliophanus damphi does the same. Um, and their red data book K, their their <clears throat> their status is unknown. We just don't have enough information about them. And th as you can see from the map, we are in gradually finding them in new sites around the UK, um, particularly since people have started using bug facts or vacuum samplers to to suck. Clubonus absultans is the Caledonian sack spider. It's also a red data book species and it's on the Scottish biodiversity list. Um, and it lives in Caledonian forest again, and it's associated with Scots pine. Um, and you can find them under bark and in pine litter, and they're mature between March and September. That's their distribution again um, in the highlands. And that's what the spider looks like. Sorry for the washed out image. It took that some years ago before I got better at microscope photography. What's really cool about them, though, is um, it, the male palp just looks absolutely awesome to me anyway. I love Clubiona as a genus um, but because you don't never really know what you've got. They all look very similar until you look at their genitals or secondary sexual organs, as is the case with males. Um, and the Clubiona subsultans has this fantastic harpoon-shaped um, projection on its palps, and I just love that. So, how do you find spiders? Um, where do you find spiders? Absolutely anywhere. You'll have stacks of them in your house right now. There'll be a bunch in your garden. Uh, you'll find spiders anywhere. And you can find them at any time. Um, so, right now, there will be spiders all over the place. A lot of them will be immature, in, uh, with, with it being winter. But there are species that have their maturity, um, mature seasons in winter. And in your home, anything goes... But most spiders are adult in late summer or autumn, so if you want to maximise the number of spider species that you see, the best time to go out collecting is summer or autumn. But there's also a smaller peak in late spring or early summer. And there are species which break the rules. There are money spiders um, that have adult phases in winter. And some species are adult all year. In fact, some money spiders have multiple um, adult seasons. Uh, some spiders are long-lived. I mean, we're, we're talking a huge number of species of spiders, and uh, in fact, some spiders are less closely related to one another um, than we are to the things that we eat or even fish. Um, so they're, they are a really diverse group, and some of them live for a few months, some live for a year, some live for a couple of years, some live for eight years. Um, in elsewhere in the world where you've got things like a bird eating spiders, tarantulas that live for decades. A good way to go out finding them is to just have a look and take something like that pooter. So that's just a regular pooter, um, just crisp powered. And you, so you basically you suck in um, the tube end, put the other end to the spider, that the spider goes shoop into the tube, um, hopefully undamaged because they're very delicate, particularly their abdomen is very easy to burst. Um, and then you've got a, a spider to look at or, or take away, whichever you may want to do. Um, just always make sure that the, there is a valve in place. So I use um, some gauze to stop the spider from going all the way down my throat. And I have had several pooter malfunctions and tasted various species of spider. They are different. Um, a hand lens is really handy. You don't need to fancy pooter like mine. You can get a, just an easy one. You can make your own. Um, yeah, hand lens times 10 time, or times 20, either is good. And yeah, there's me out putting again. I do a lot of putting. Another thing that I find that works really well, actually, are these gigantic forceps. Um, they're sold as spider forceps. I, I think they're intended for feeding um, tarantulas. But because they're so large, uh, you can use them in very delicately. And th that's me on top of mountains where I'm overturning rocks and finding money spiders, mainly very, very small spiders, just a few millimeters long. And I found that with something like those forceps, you can get them into wee cracks and you can take a spider out without damaging it if you're very careful. Pitfall traps are a, a good way of finding spiders, particularly those that are active um, at night. Um, and you can leave them for some time if you've got a preservative in. So um, I generally use 
a 70% antifreeze with a wee bit of washing up liquid to break the surface tension on the top. Um, if you don't put any preservative in and you just leave a pit bull trap out that's dry, um, you will catch things, but basically beetles and um, centipedes will end up eating everything else that's in the pot if you don't check it really regularly. Oh, and obviously I've put some uh, gauze, sorry, not gauze, um, chicken wire over the top to prevent vertebrates falling in. Um, everyone has different designs. I dig that into the ground with the trap to make it very difficult for the, um, the cover to be removed by animals. Sweep netting, um, so it's taking a pretty robust net and sweeping it through vegetation, catches a, a whole bunch of spiders and other invertebrates. That's my colleague Neil uh, doing that there. Bark traps are a really good way of finding things. They're not a very, you don't get a lot of different species when you use a bark trap, but what you do get is hard to find any other way. And so a bark trap basically is a double layer of bubble wrap folded in on itself um, with some dark plastic to keep light out. That's then wrapped around a tree and left for four weeks or more. Um, and when you come back, you can take that off the tree and a lot of invertebrates that live in the cracks of bark and under bark will have moved into the gap between the trap and the tree. And then you can also open out the trap and more invertebrates will have moved into there. Um, and you can select what you take. And that's a good way of finding the lichen running spider. And also um, particularly male uh, Caledonian sack spiders, Clubiona subsultans. Uh, bee nest boxes are actually a great way of finding spiders too. Um, there are quite a few spiders that will make um, a, a, a web within the holes. Um, thing, spiders like um, lace weavers, like Amarobius, um, and also other spiders that will make retreats in there. Um, so I found that to be a very effective way of finding particularly female Caledonian sack spiders, Clubiona subsultans. You can brush trees and just dislodge um, invertebrates between bark. Um, yeah, that's bug vac. Um, like I say, an industrial pooter out in action, all COVID safe uh, last year. Um, malaise traps, they're flight interception traps. They're not really designed for catching spiders, but you do get spiders in them. But you also get a lot of other things. So I'm personally not a big fan of malaise traps unless you're doing a, a structured study, but everyone has different um, opinions on these things. And it doesn't get a huge diversity of spiders, but what it does do is give you some fantastic time series data. Swooping water is a good way of finding some particular species of spiders such as this um, pirate otter spider, Pirata pyraticus, um, which is relatively underrecorded, um, I, I think, because I think our acknowledgists probably just don't sample water very often. I do a lot of newt surveys and I see them frequently. And in terms of giving specimens to other acknologists to help build their reference collections, I think I've given more um, pirate otter spiders to people than any other species. Um, and there's also spiders like this, the um, raft spider. We do have a species of raft spider in Scotland. It's relatively rare here. It's not the rare one that occurs um, in England, but, um, but we do have one species and they're pretty cool. And we also have water spiders, which actually um, hunt under the water. Um, and I, I find them when I'm out doing new surveys, because you, when you shine the torch in the water, you see them with their sort of air bubble around their abdomen, glinting like silver in the light. It's really cool. So spider anatomy, as I've mentioned earlier, they have two body parts, a cephalothorax, which has their eyes and their brain. Um, and that's where their um, chelicerae, which are adapted as fangs are. And they've got their eight legs and a couple of arms known as pedipalps. The abdomen is where the majority of their organs are. Um, and unlike the cephalothorax, which has a hard exoskeleton, the abdomen is actually soft, so it's very fragile. Um, so you need to be careful with spiders. And that's also where the spinnerets are located so to spin the silk. Um, on the underside, um, there's various features. You can see there the chelicerae with the fangs. Um, but of particular importance, um, if you're going to be identifying spiders, 
are the palps in males. Um, so they in male spiders, palps are adapted to secondary sexual organs that are used in mating, and these are distinctive to species. And also the epigyne, which is um, female genitals. Um, and they are also generally adapted um, and unique for each species. There are, there are groups of spiders which don't have um, hard and um, uh, intricate epigynes, in, in which case males are generally the way to go for identifying. And also um, epigynes are often less distinct between species and potentially more variable than the male palps. So, in a lot, so although it may be easier to identify a female spider because you just flip her on her back and have a look at the epigyne um, from that perspective, it can be more difficult to get them to species. Um, dissection can be really helpful for that. Um, but male spiders, once you get used to manipulating spiders under a microscope, are a lot easier to identify to species with confidence. There are two suborders of spiders. There's Orthognatha, which are also known as megalomorphs, and they are um, tarantulas and such. And there's Libidognatha, which are also known as araniomorphs, and they are the other spiders. Uh, you can tell them apart because the um, the Orthognatha have these um, fangs which bite backwards, and the Libidognatha have fangs which pinch effectively inwards. In Scotland we do have one species um, of Orthognatha uh, which is Atipasaphinus, the purse web weaver. Um, it's only been found in Dumfries and Galloway from a, a few sites though um, and it, it's a really cool looking thing as you can see in the Chalicerae are quite a significant um, part, uh, si well, they're significant size compared to the rest of the spider. And that's one on um, my friend Nick Nimbus's hand who took these photographs of course um, and you, so you can see it's not that big those chelicerae are pretty large uh, that's the web they make um, that's just uh, Nick Nimbus that's actually my photo um, but it it's um, as you can see it's really hard to see and people often refer to them as dirty fingers because they basically the bit that, of the web that you can find is about the size of a human finger and it's camouflaged with vegetation stuck to it um, and it actually goes underground up to 60 centimeters in a burrow um, and this, what happens is if a, an invertebrate walks over that um, dirty finger um, the spider comes charging up um, from the burrow and bites through the silk and pulls its prey in. Um, and they actually respond really well to tuning forks. So um, you can use a tuning fork or an electric toothbrush to lure spiders out um, of the, onto their webs. And that definitely works for, um, for the species. I've done it before. Um, however, all you see are two black fangs biting through the silk. It doesn't come out unless you take it out. Although males do have to leave their webs to find mates, of course. All the rest of the spiders in Scotland um, are um, Labidognatha. And these are all the families known in the UK. The red ones are those which haven't been found in Scotland, at least so far. How do you identify spiders? Well, you look at the webs. It's something which is often... Um, often ignored really um, uh, and one on my to-do list for retirement was to write a book about spider webs but amazingly someone else has already done that so I can scratch that off my to-do list and just focus on writing a book on money spiders um, but yeah webs are distinctive and can really help you narrow down what kind of spider you have so those are two types of orb webs from different families of orb weavers if you have a look you can see in the top web there is a mess of silk in the middle and in the bottom one it's just a, a neat hole. The top one is an areniid web so that would be um, like a garden cross spider which you may see in your garden or the four spot or weaver that I showed a photo of earlier. The bottom one is a tetragnathid web. Tetragnathids sitting on the web with their four shorter um, back legs um, across that hole and the, their long four front legs pointing down, but not always. Um, very often, both of these um, groups of spiders are in a retreat. 
with silk um, attaching vegetation together off to the side of the web. But just by looking at the web, you can narrow down what you've got there. These are a couple of um, tube webs. Um, so there's a bit of a giveaway with the top one because there's spiders in the picture. It's an Amarobia, a lace weaver. Um, the bottom one is a Segestria, um, which is a completely different group of spiders. Um, and they both have a similar um, hunting technique in that they spin this web with trip wires that come out to the sides um, and catch prey on those. Um, but the lace web weavers um, have a, a pretty messy web and it's really fluffy and bluish looking because um, they, they make this special silk called uh, cribblet silk. They've got an extra organ to do that. Um, the bottom one, the Suggestria, is a lot neater and has um, spokes coming out a bit like a wheel. These are a couple of um, of messy webs, maybe you might say. Um, the top one is a linified web, so it looks like a hammock. It's um, that's a Nerian web. It's quite a big one, but small money spiders make similar hammock webs. Um, the bottom web is a therided web, and it's a more three dimensional shape. And really interestingly, people used to think that these were primitive webs, and that the orb web was um, something that's evolved more recently. And then we now know from fossils and from amber. Um, that the orb web is very ancient and these are recent in evolutionary history. Um, and particularly the therided webs are really an engineering masterpiece. Um, they're built for the exact situation the spider is in and they are three-dimensional and they catch prey in a three-dimensional way. So for example, um, there may be trip wires going down to the ground um, which are aimed to catch invertebrates walking underneath the web. And when the invertebrate gets on caught by one of those threads, it points up to where the spider is. And then the other structures are aimed at catching other invertebrates that may be on the vegetation or flying. So they're really super cool. Um, when I started looking at spiders, I found linophyids and theridids to look quite similar. Um, they both have quite bulbous abdomens to my eye. Um, and knowing the difference between webs was a real, really, really helpful um, for me to start narrowing those down to the families. I'd be very surprised if you find that one in Scotland because it's from a ladybird spider. Um, it's a similar kind of idea to the um, purse web spider that we had up earlier in that it's a camouflaged web. It's actually a platform just above a burrow. And so when an invertebrate walks over that web um, and gets caught, the ladybird spider comes out of the burrow and gets its prey. Um, I mean, you never know what you might find, though. It's always worth keeping these things in mind. Uh, this is a nursery web spider, um, Pysora mirabilis. These spiders, um, they carry their egg sacs in their jaws. Um, they also actually have a really complicated mating um, system where, by a ritual basically, where the male presents um, a gift to the female and all that kind of stuff, which is really cool. But the, the, the mother carries the egg sac in her jaws until the eggs are about ready to hatch, at which point she spins a nursery web around the egg sac. And she then guards those eggs until the spiderlings hatch or she gets eaten um, or killed otherwise. In fact, it would be two, two years ago now, we had a really hot summer. And I was doing a lot of uh, surveys in England where it was very dry as well. And I found quite a lot of desiccated nursery web spiders uh, doing the surveys that year. I suppose they just sat out on their web um, and dried out, unfortunately. Uh, this is an egg sac. Um, now, the spider's in the picture, but um, not always so. Um, this is a cave spider's egg sac. Uh, it's about the size of a ping pong ball, and it hangs from the ceiling of caves or, or ruined buildings. Um, and they persist for a very long time, even after they've hatched. So if you go into a cave or an old, um, an old castle dungeon and look up and see these things, then you know there's cave spiders there, probably metaminardi, but there's also... Uh, another rarer species. And this is actually a zebra spider web that, uh, that I found. Now, generally, zebra spiders are associated with human habitation. This I actually found in a really ancient orchard, uh, which was more like a, a woodland than, um, than anything cultivated. And it was under the bark, and it's an egg sac retreat uh, for the, the nursery, sorry, not nursery spider, the zebra spider. And a lot of jumping spiders make similar um, egg retreats. And this is a lantern spider egg sac. Um, and although we didn't find the spider that day, we certainly knew that they were around because they had these 
wonderful lantern egg sacs hanging around. Um, I find the eyes of spiders really helpful for identifying them. So here's just a few different spider eyes. So um, at the, the top left and also top right, we've got a, different views of jumping spider eyes. Now, jumping spiders, um, most spiders have very poor eyesight. They've got all sorts of other senses that we don't frankly completely understand because um, they're so poorly studied. But jumping spiders have big eyes and they do make pictures like us, just like our eyes. So when a jumping spider is looking at you, it's seeing you. Um, beneath that, uh, on the left, we've got um, another uh, hunting spider. It's, it is a wolf spider, um, and it has larger eyes, but it, it doesn't. It's not able to see as well as the jumping spiders. Um, and underneath the wolf spider, so again on the left, there's an orb weaver and a araneid. So that could be a garden cross spider or a four spot orb weaver, whatever. Um, very different eye arrangements. Now. There's a there's a two groups of spiders, um, Clobionidae and Nafosidae, that I found very difficult to tell apart when I started getting into spiders. Um, so they're both active hunters at night time, and I think they look quite similar. Um, and we all see things differently, so you may not find them to be similar, um, but I certainly did. And the real, the key for me, the breakthrough in identifying them easily, was noticing the difference in their eyes, which you can see in in this slide. Um, so at the top we've got an aphosid, and they've got the the sort of slanted eyes, um, and then underneath that is a clobionid, and they've got purely round eyes, um, and that's just a really really handy feature. Top tip, don't look at the colours, mostly. There we have a load of different looking spiders. And if we were doing this course in person, we would go out and catch some spiders. And I would imagine that people would be coming back with a lot of these. And every spider on that slide is the same species. Um, it's Metalina uh, segmentata. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think it is. So um, there's two species, there's Metalina uh, segmentata and Metalina mangii, which are very, very similar. And you can tell them apart from a marking on the underside. But basically, the, the thing is, you, they all look very different and you would collect a lot of them and they'd all be the same species. So markings are not necessarily very helpful. There are exceptions. Do look at the shape, though do have quite different body shapes. Like I say, they're not very closely related to each other, many of these groups. So on top left, we've got a woodlife spider, um, Distera crocata. Um, in, in the middle at the top, um, we've got a philodromid, uh, which is a running crab spider. Um, underneath the running crab spider, there's a timicid, which is a regular crab spider. And you can see they're, they're different in shape, particularly in their legs and abdomen. Um, bottom left is a jumping spider. Top right is um, Fulcus phalangioides, a daddy long leg spider. Uh, underneath that is a, a theridid. All quite different. And yeah, that's really just a slide to say you never know what you might find if you do look at spiders. So th this is a spider I found at Flanders Moss in 2018. Um, and I wasn't out there looking for that. I was actually out to find bog sun jumpers for something that Chris Packham was filming. But um, I, I collected a few spiders, came back, um, and found this, uh, that I'd found this, the bleeding heart spider. And the nearest other populations are 300 odd miles um, to the south in England and where they're generally found in gardens. Although in Ireland, they are found on bogs as well. So uh, it's not entirely unheard of, but it's just really, really cool. I should say, don't go out collecting spiders at Flanders Moss without permission though. Um, it's a site of special scientific interest and the invertebrates are protected there. Um, and that can be the case on other triple SIs too. And yeah, there is its distribution now. <laughs> and yeah, this is another spider that um, I got sent in the post to identify. Um, it's a type of wandering spider, Phonutria boliviensis. Um, and this is a group of spiders, um, ten a day, which do not occur in the UK at all. Um, and this turns up in Aberdeenshire in a shipment of bananas. Um, it's quite big. It's pretty cool. And that was a really a wonderful opportunity, actually, because um, in trying to identify it, and I got a lot of help on this from a guy called Stuart Longhorn, um, who is an academic arachnologist um, studying tropical spiders. 
Um, we found that there wasn't when you when you when you describe a species generally you'd have a description of it and its key characteristics and with spiders that generally includes its genitals there'd also be a specimen kept in a museum somewhere as the type the original that people can compare others to to make sure it's the same species um, we found that Phenetria boliviensis um, in its original description didn't include um, detailed genital information and the type specimen doesn't seem to exist either. Um, so there's a lot of spiders out there that get called Phenetria boliviensis, which may well not be the same species. There's quite a lot of variety. Um, and yeah, we published an article on that and, it, and it's quite funny that it's describes its genitals and how to identify it from a, a specimen from Scotland, when in fact they generally occur in Central America. Um, but yeah, that's you never know what you're going to get. What do you need? Well, this is more or less my setup at the moment to run this for you. Um, although I'm not using the earphones, obviously. And you need a microscope. Really, really useful. Um, or I use a microscope. Um, and books and all sorts. But basics, hand lens, really useful to have. Times 10 is all right. Um, a stereo microscope with times 40 magnification um, or times 90 is even better or even more magnification if you can. Um, a microscope can then go up to 120 um, depending on exactly how I've got it set up, but I don't often need to go that to that level of magnification and I won't be using it today. Um, lighting is at least as important as the microscope really because if you've got a great lens and you're zoomed in really close, what you see is only going to be as good as the light that um, is shining on your specimen. Um, forceps, pointed needles, paper pencil to manipulate the spider and also the, I find, um, and I still do this when particularly when I come across a spider I'm not 100% sure what it, what, what it is, um, is to draw the genitals because when you compare um, the, the genitals to diagrams and books you're going to be looking at two-dimensional um, drawings that someone else has made and I find having a two-dimensional drawing that I've made is a very good way of comparing rather than looking directly down the microscope. Uh, petri dishes or whatever to put specimens in and preserved spiders so a reference collection. Um, if you can build up a reference collection of spiders that you have identified to species and perhaps you've had these confirmed by um, someone who knows more about spiders than you do then you can go back and compare other specimens that you collect to those to confirm which species you have. It's a really really handy thing to have and you can preserve them in very strong white rum according to a book that a friend gave me um, about spiders in St Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, very, very strong white rum though, and I don't think you can get that here so easily. Um, so alternatively, isopropanol or ethanol is fine at 70% dilution. Um, now you need a license to have ethanol, um, I think, uh, but you do not need a license to have isopropanol. Um, and you can buy isopropanol in chemists as a disinfectant for a first aid kit. So if you're not needing an awful lot of it, um, you can get like 250 mil, 500 mil bottles um, that way. I go through a lot of it, so I order it in 25 litre drums. Um, keys, so books, um, Roberts, um, are, his books are sort of the gold standard um, in Britain and in much of Europe. And very sadly, um, Mike Roberts passed away very recently. Um, but his, yeah, his contribution to aeronology is uh, unparalleled, really. Uh, he's a total legend. There's also online... Um, keys as well. So there's our, this um, Spiders of Europe site, which is it's really fantastic. It um, it shows diagrams from of genitals of spiders from all sorts of different publications. And certainly something I have found in life is that how I see spiders' genitals are not necessarily the same way as how somebody else who's drawn a picture has. And uh, you pick up on different features, um, and so you, that's really handy. In fact, I find a Swedish spider book um, called by a guy called Almquist to be um, closer to how I see spider genitals than any other um, author's stuff. Sadly, he died as well. Um, once you have identified your spider. Well, hopefully you're going to record it. And to do that, you're going to need to know um, what it is. So you identify its genus. If you can, get its species even better. 
but don't take things further than you that you're comfortable with. That, um, and don't stretch your identif identification. Um, where it was, so a grid reference, a super, a location name, and habitat is really useful information to gather as well. When you found it, so the date, and your name, who you are, um, because who you are is quite important in someone else assessing how likely you are to be correct or if something needs to be checked. And if something needs to be checked, then you need to keep voucher specimens. So as somebody who knows more than you about spiders can just confirm that um, you've got the right species. And, you know, I I collect voucher specimens um, for all sorts of spiders. If, so if they're to identify or found them somewhere that's unlikely, that's so way outside their known range or in a habitat that's not been recorded from before. Um, and I still get spiders checked by people who know more about spiders than I do. It's a great way of learning. Um, and then you might send your records to local record centres or you might send it to the um, spider recording scheme, which I would encourage you to do. Um, and I would check that out. Um, so if you if you set up an account, which is free to do um, with the spider recording scheme, and it, there's no obligation for you to send in your records in or anything, um, but it lets you interrogate the data um, in a lot of detail on the website. So you can look at where spiders have been found and when um, in sort of regional um, so, you know, zoom in on the map type thing. If you don't have an account, you can only look at the UK, really. And that also records habitats and the seasonality of spiders. So it, it's a, such a useful resource. And yeah, just to go back to spider anatomy before we do the ID stuff. As I mentioned, the key features to get to species are the genitals or secondary sexual organs in the males. Um, so there's the palp and then there's the epigyne. Um, for the, so the, the palp in the male, epigyne in the female is really what you need to be looking at. And that's the end of my sort of spiel, my um, introductory talk. Uh, this is a photo of um, a club, sorry, um, a chiracanthium, I think. Um, spider that's e eating some other invertebrate eggs that Nick Nimbus took. I used quite a lot of Nick's photos in this um, with his permission and his photos are amazing and I'd encourage you to check out his Instagram account. So our, this would be a good time to break for questions. I think uh, we've got at least five minutes that we could do that. Craig? That's great. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Um, shall I stop sharing my screen? Um, doop, doop, doop. There we go. Okay. Uh, bear with me one bear moment. Yeah, there are uh, there are a few questions. There, there were there was some discussion going on um, while you were presenting, Chris. Uh, mainly, well, mainly around field guides, and uh, Tom Thompson um, from Bug Life was kind enough to share um, Britain spiders, this this one, and the, and the newer edition. Um, and you've you've just covered a number of keys in your presentation, and as I indicated, you would. Um, yeah. I mean, I would. I don't know how visible I am right now. Um, yeah, I'm, I spotlighted quite... you, Chris, so I think uh, oh, everybody cool. should see you. Cool, cool. Um, so this is the book that I would, I would, so the, the guide that's already been mentioned is a fantastic starter book and it's got wonderful pictures and I would say that because some of them are mine, but um, yeah, it's a great starter, a great thing to flick through, but you won't be able to identify everything to species from that, in fact, not very much at all. Um, so I would recommend this book if you want to take it to the next level. Um, so this is um, Colin's field guide, it's easily available. Um, and it covers all of the spiders in the UK, except for the money spiders, so the linophiids. Now, in Scotland, there are over 200 species of linophiids, so it's a sizable chunk of our 440-odd species, um, but they are harder to ID. So but this will do everything else, and it's got wonderful um, colour plates. So Mike Roberts did all these paintings of spiders, um, and... It's got those in there, and it's got um, a keys, and it's got descriptions of the species and diagrams of the genitals and things to compare to. So I, I'd recommend in, investing in that if you do want to identify spiders to species. And then after that, 
there's epic books like this one. Um, now, my one fell apart, so I had to get it rebound because I use it quite a lot. Um, again, by Mike Roberts. Um, so this it's a three volume book, but you can get it in a compact edition that um, is in two volumes and it includes even more watercolors um, in the third volume um, and they're like the whole size of the page. So they're really detailed. Um, but yeah, this basically is more or less the same affair as that Collins book, but it includes all of the money spiders as well. Um, and it's amazing. And this is the other book that I mentioned. Um, this is a Swedish book. Now their spider um, fauna is very similar to ours and it wouldn't surprise me if maybe we've got some species that we've not found yet that also occur in Scandinavia. Um, but um, yeah, so it's by this guy called Almquist. It was meant to be three volumes, but he died before he finished the third one. Um, but the two volumes that do exist I find absolutely excellent. Uh, Michelle has asked, what, what is the web book that you mentioned? Um, I will bring that up in the break. It's in my living room right now because I've been reading it because it just came out. Um, and I'll show that then. OK, fantastic. Uh, the, there was actually a question earlier on from... Um, just scrolling to, to, to... I'm scrolling up through the questions and they keep on bouncing back as people ask more questions. <laughs> Um, one or two questions I'd answered. Uh, arachnids are a, a class of invertebrates. Um, pooting, somebody had asked about pooting and what a pooter is. Um, essentially, it sucks creatures up through a tube into a container for identification. I think there are several pictures of Pooters through the presentation, so hopefully that got answered in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would be great to have a session on macro photography in the field, please. Um, so Steve's made a made a request for another. Hit. Well, <laughs> it would be great to do anything in the field at the moment. <laughs> it certainly would. <laughs> I'm I'm lucky in my job. I still get out into the field. Um, but yeah, no, that would be super, and I would like to go on that course too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe maybe one for a later date. Um, Tabitha has asked, "Do you ever use EyeShine to find spiders in the UK?" Or are they usually too small for that? I know you can do it in areas where spiders are larger. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I have I've gone spotlighting for spiders in uh, like Africa and stuff, which is great fun. Um, but it does work in the UK too. So um, if you go out with a really high powered spotlight, like I often do to do things like newt surveys at night, and you shine it around, um, you can still pick up spiders. Um, with their eyes reflecting the light um, as long as, you know, I mean, obviously they are small, so you may or may not notice them depending on how good you are at spotting things, but it does work. Okay. Uh, Patrick's asked, purse web spiders, do they camouflage their webs or, do, or does debris just accumulate? I think it's a deliberate action, so I think they deliberately camouflage their web. Okay. Uh, is the bug vac you use the same as a Vortis suction sampler and where are they available? So everyone, so it's just a leaf blower um, that's put on suck with a net on the end of it. Uh, so you can use any sort of leaf blower that has that ability and if you can get a suitable net or make one. Um, the one that I use is a type of Husqvarna, uh, which I got because it's very reliable. It can work in any with the engine in any position. Um, it's got a lot of power and it's quite light, so I, I take it up mountains and things uh, while I'm camping out looking for spiders. Um, you can get electric ones, which are quite good as well. They they don't collect as many spiders as the petrol-driven ones. They don't get quite the same suction. And I have used them, in fact, when I was doing surveys on Isle of Man because um, I got the the Isle of, the Manx Wildlife Trust provided me with one to use there and it was electric um, and I felt that um, it well it certainly didn't get as many spiders but it works fine um, wh whether or not it gets the same diversity I don't know there's some studies which um, are inconclusive on that 
Shannon has asked, do the bug vacs harm the spiders? Not generally. Um, generally, they're fine at, at worst stunned. So you can tip out the net onto a tray and then you can select what you take away. So I find that really useful because I, if I'm only looking at spiders, I'll only take spiders. And I've, I can tell um, if a spider is mature by looking at it, um, even if it's a money spider these days. I, so I only take mature spiders and so that avoids killing young ones which can't be identified species. Um, if you use it in say wet conditions um, you will get a bunch of mushy spiders um, and if you use it in places that are sandy or rocky then you will pulverize the spiders so it obviously depends a bit. Uh, John has asked what do you use to kill spiders for reference specimens? I use 70% isopropanol. Which you you covered, didn't you? Um, uh, a question from, uh, well, firstly, a question from Ellie. What what did you study to get into this career? She's currently studying zoology. Uh, nice one. I studied zoology at Aberdeen University. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a good way to go. I didn't learn, I, wouldn't, I learned lots of transferable skills. Um, at university that were broadly useful for my career and also general life. I didn't learn about spiders there. Um, that's something that I did myself. Yeah, there's a number of uh, there's a number of routes into a career in conservation these days. Um, various different courses as well as zoology. But... Yeah, in fact, actually, I wrote an article for the Countryside Job Service recently. They asked me to write an article about how to get into this kind of career, and I did that. So you should be able to read that online, and it covers the different approaches you can take. Oh, cool. Um, a question from Bethia. Um, what do you think is the best way to encourage the wider public to care about spiders and spider conservation? Tell them how awesome they are and show them how cool they are. Good answer. Um, the only way. <laughs> what what kind of careers are out there for those interested in spiders outside of academia? Well, I'm not an academic, and I didn't take an academic route, so I guess I'm a good person to ask. Um, I mean, obviously, there are um, conservation charities such as Bug Life that specialize in invertebrates, um, and there's other conservation charities that have positions for people who have specialisms in invertebrates too, like the RSPB and wildlife trusts. Um, so that's a, that's a thing you could do. Um, there are a small number of jobs in the um, government agencies that deal with that kind of thing as well. Um, and then there's consultancy, which is what I do. Um, and that, that's maybe a bit trickier. There's not so much work in that. And I think um, it has increased over the years. Um, England is, has more of it than Scotland does in my experience, um, but Scotland is on the up with it. People are beginning to take note of invertebrates, which is really heartening. Um, so you, there's invertebrate work in consultancy too. You just might have to really work to get it. I don't know if you have any other ideas, Craig. Um. Uh, well, that's a that's a fairly comprehensive answer in itself. I think uh, there there are a number of different routes into to careers in conservation, and you've just got to keep keep an ear to the ground, really. I would actually like just add that um, you don't have to be an academic to study things either. Um, so I publish papers on spiders and I'm not associated with any academic institute and I do it in my spare time. And I think a lot historically a lot of the great natural history um, discoveries have been made by um, amateurs for lack of a better word. Uh, so there's definitely something to be said in that. Um, and I remember I was speaking to Mike Roberts um, some years ago now um, about these sorts of things. He's, I mean, he was a doctor. He was not a, an academic Spider-Man, and he's made, written some of the best books on spiders in the world, including um, being involved in detailed ones on their anatomy and um, their spinnerets and how they work. And he was, when we were talking about things, he was saying that his his country, you know, he was saying he's he's described these things, he's drawn them, but he doesn't know what spiders do with them because um, he's not gone out to look at what they do, and that's something that people should be doing, and th there are ways of publishing that. Tom's contributed with a comment saying that volunteering at a museum is also good. 
um, by way of getting involved. And, and I yeah, know that, that's, that's actually, yeah, that's a very good point. And careers in museums too. <laughs> I know that Ash would certainly, Ashley, tomorrow's speaker would certainly um, echo that sentiment. Yeah, and actually that reminds me, I didn't mention my presentation and I usually do. I think it's because it's a stripped down one for this. Um, museum reference collections are, you know, museum collections are an amazing resource. You can go in, in normal times, not the viral apocalypse, but once that gets cancelled, you can go to the museum and use the collections um, and they have so many of them, so many spiders, so many other invertebrates um, and they have microscopes as well. Um, museums are great. Yeah, grand. Um, Daniel has asked, are there any spiders in the UK that can bite through your skin? Yes, I have been bitten by spiders myself. Um, I am none the worse for it. Is the bug vac noise vibrations disruptive? Um, the noise and vibrations of the bug vac, are they disruptive? Yeah. I mean, there are, there's if you're using that for an extended period, there are health hazards for yourself and anyone who's close to you. Um, but it doesn't seem to really affect wildlife particularly. It certainly doesn't affect the things that you collect um, in a life-threatening way. Uh, a question from Donna: What what is the link to climate change? What is the link to climate change? Is the health of spiders? So climate change is it will be affecting spider populations for sure. Uh, in Scotland, we have a lot of species which are associated with um, the tops of mountains and they've got nowhere else to go. They can't go anywhere higher. So as things warm up and stuff, we're going to lose them. Um, and some of them occur in other countries on mountains and also in tundra and stuff. But spiders are not as well studied as they really should be. The UK is an exception. We've, as with lots of natural history, we've really looked at it in a lot of detail. We know a lot about our spiders. Other countries, not so much. And the linophyids in particular, the money spiders, don't tend to get studied in other countries much at all. So, for instance, green, in cold climates, um, linophidae are the biggest group of spiders. Um, but in Greenland, they've not been studied and there's hardly any species known um, of linophyids or spiders there. And most of the spiders there are probably going to be linophyids and probably some that occur here. Um, also, the how wet things are will make a difference. So... Spiders, particularly, well, spiders breathe through modified gills, effectively. So they need a degree of moisture in the air for those to work. But ironically, they drown really easily, too. Um, and most of the species in Scotland require around about 80% humidity to be able to breathe. Um, but yeah, if they get really wet, they die. So I guess that could affect things. Uh, there are quite a few more questions. Well, the there are a few more questions coming in. I'd suggest maybe five more minutes and then we move on to the next um, part of the presentation, Chris, if that's all right with you. Yeah, well, if we do five more minutes of questions and maybe take a short break, that would be handy for me. Perfect. Yeah, a short, a short break, get a cup of tea. Um, and yeah. then back to the... So you get to... everything set up for... Yep. Okay. Nice bit. Um, Maya has shared, uh, just found the Collins Field Guide on offer, so that's great on NHBS website. So anybody that's interested in that field guide, um, a link to that in the conversation. Um, Charlotte said, can also recommend as a mature student choosing a species to study by yourself. You make great contacts and folk to mentor you. Um, uh, you, and you can get mentors through the British Arachnological Society as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure they still do that. And that was very useful to me when I was younger and learning. Uh, Joanna has said uh, she, an odd question, but do wolf spiders have territories? How much do we know about their navigation? It's a really good question. And the answer is we don't know. Um, so go out and have, watch some wolf spiders and find out. Um, can you see the conversation at the moment, Chris? Laura has just shared a link nope. to uh, getting academic qualifications. I was actually going to look for that link. So um, I think that's the link that you were referring to. Ah, getting academic qualifications. Like uh, yeah, that's a, that's a picture of me. So I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's countryside, a link to countrysidejobs.com. So thanks for that, Laura. You've saved me the, the trouble of doing that. 
Um, anybody that wants a link to that article, uh, that's in the conversation now as well. Um, Ian has asked, which spider will bite you? Are they found in your bed, hide under your pillow? Um, uh, no. <laughs> really, don't worry about spiders biting you. It's so unlikely to happen. Um, I have caught, I, I have no idea how many spiders I've caught, like hundreds of thousands of spiders. And I've been bitten in Scotland twice um, where it's gone through my skin. And the, there's, unless you're allergic to the venom, there is no spider in Scotland that can cause you any real harm. Um, in fact, the last time I got bitten by a spider, um, I, I was with my kids and I let them see that it wasn't hurting me. Um, so I let it bite me for a bit longer than I probably would have otherwise. And um, it just left two little marks on my hand. I've got a picture somewhere that were tiny. Um, there was no swelling even. It was just, uh, it was a non-event. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a, a degree of arachnophobia in that question. Um, a, a question from Patrick. I suppose it depends on species, but are spiders good at dispersing to neighbouring habitat? Yes, spiders are amazing dispersers, um, and it, and probably most of them are, because um, they can. Uh, spiders can do this thing called ballooning. You may have seen it. Uh, you certainly, you'll probably come across it a lot with money spiders, but even uh, big things like crab spiders can do it, where they throw a bit of silk into the air and then they go up into the air. And so, it, when I do surveys on mountains, I find lots of lowland species on there too that have obviously dispersed in that way. They've been found high up in the air. Um, and the really cool thing is that th this is um, a, this is an electrical feature. It's to do with the charge of the silk. And so the, um, they get sucked into the air and disperse through electricity, which is just wonderful. Um, hey, Amy's just commented, you've, you've earned a brew, Chris. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I would second that. Um, Alison's just said she, she lost the picture when you were showing ID guides. Would it be possible to see again just a quick look? Um, well, th th there is a link to the Collins field guide in the conversation now, um, yeah. which you will, and, and a link to the, um, the, the wild guides, um, yeah, cool. this, this one. So, so there, there's a link to both of these in the conversation and the larger field guide that Chris held up. Yeah, I can I can dig out a link to because I think the the compact edition of this is still available. I think this the really big um, multiple volume one if you wanted that, but you don't need this to start out at all. It is a wonderful book, but you don't need it to begin looking at spiders. Yeah. Um, and just a couple more questions about um, spider bites. And uh, uh, David has commented, my daughter was scared of spiders. Uh, I got a bug box and now she's fascinated, which is uh, one, one way of getting people interested is actually showing them. Um, cool. Well done. Uh, Mike has asked, is, is, the bite, is, is it a bite or a pinch? Well, I mean, it depends. On your point of view, I suppose. Um, I've not I, in the UK. I've not been bitten by a um, by a, by a purse web weaver, which is the only like tarantula here. So that would probably that, that would be different because the fangs go like that. Let's um, see, like that. Um, whereas the all the rest of our spiders do pinch. So they kind of it's kind of a pinch. <laughs> um, a pinch, pinch with punctures occasionally. <laughs> Sims asked uh, an unusual question: how, how many spiders in total in Scotland, or and the whole, of, or and the whole of the UK, or per square meter? I'm not sure that's answerable. Uh, I'm, I'm not. And I'm not sure whether or not they're getting a number of species. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean it's not an answerable question in terms of individuals. Um, I did read somewhere that there's like 500 pseudoscorpions in every square meter of soil, but. Um, I think that might not be true in Scotland because I don't find that many, even when I'm looking for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, time, time for a break, I think. Um, maybe uh, maybe just five minutes, Chris, and we can, we can go and get a cup of tea and then come back for yeah. the second session, if that's all right with you and everybody else. That's fine. Any, any more questions anybody has, then um, we will have another Q&A session at the end of the second session. So you'll have another chance to ask Chris any questions 
um, in about an hour or so. Okay, but in the meantime, just give us five minutes and then we'll uh, be back. Okay. Cool.